Um, hello, everyone. So today we'll have a series of uh, two 30 minute talks. Our first talk is going to be by John Straub, and our second talk is going to be by uh, Yuji Goto. And the way we're going to structure it is that after the first 30 minute talk, we're going to have 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll move to a second talk have another series of 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll open the discussion up to anyone who wants to join the panel and talk more informally with our speakers. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor John Straub. John received his bachelor's from the University of Maryland College Park, his PhD from Columbia University, he was then a postdoc at Harvard before uh, starting an independent position at Boston University. He's a leading expert in the field of simulations and uh, theory of proteins, membranes, and complex molecular assemblies. And he has received many awards. He is also well known as an editor at the Journal of Chemical Physics. And I'm gonna give him a plug because I hear his book just came out. So I urge you to order it. I think it's available on Amazon, maybe. It's called Mathematical Methods for Molecular Sciences. Um, so John, I will turn it over to you. All right, thank, thank you, Joan. Let me bring my slides up here. Make sure I have my pointer. Great. Yeah, thanks very much for the kind introduction. And thanks to Joan and Rams, uh, Magda and, and Bikash for all the work organizing this, uh, this Zoominar. It's been a really great experience for me. I've learned uh, a, a lot of good science and I'm looking forward to learning more in the second talk today uh, from Yuji Goto. So uh, I had originally planned in my uh, talk when I thought it was going to be a slightly longer to talk about two themes. Uh, one is the role of heterogeneity in, in membrane and, and cholesterol in A beta protein genesis. Uh, and then I also hope to talk about work done in collaboration with Dave Thurumalai's lab and a, a, a very talented postdoc, Dabayan Chakraborty on our uh, NSTAR hypothesis that we have considered over, over time. I'm, I'm actually going to just speak about A beta protein genesis and, and in particular in the role of membrane uh, and cholesterol in, in that process. Um, I'll talk about the work of a number, number of people in the group, but uh, in particular, the work of a very talented graduate student in the lab, uh, George Pantelopoulos. So uh, a, a little bit of background on the synthesis of, uh, of A beta protein. So um, many of you know uh, that A beta protein is known to form aggregates uh, that are associated with a, to play a path pathogenic role in uh, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there is a precursor protein, the amyloid precursor protein that is processed by secretases in membrane, APP, is a 770 amino acid protein. It, it has a single transmembrane domain. And this uh, protein can be cleaved along two competing pathways. One is a non-amyloidogenic uh, pathway where the protein is initially cleaved by, by alpha secretase. And uh, the other is the amyloidogenic pathway where there's an initial cleavage by uh, beta secretase, which is another single pass membrane uh, protein to create a uh, fragment, the C-terminal fragment of the amyloid precursor protein uh, referred to as C99. And that C99 uh, can uh, undergo a homodimerization, uh, which we have studied in, in the past, uh, and also can uh, bind to and be processed by gamma secretase. And it's gamma secretase that carries out a processive cleavage of the C99 protein, uh, and then uh, liberates the uh, A beta protein into the extracellular uh, region. And A beta protein uh, then can go on to form 
oligomers, which have been demonstrated uh, to be toxic, uh, fibrils, also perhaps membrane associated states and can self organize uh, into, into pores that may play a role in, uh, in causing cell death. One of the reasons that we are so interested and the field has been interested uh, for some time in the genesis of A-beta protein is that it's known that A-beta forms a number of uh, isoforms, different lengths of A-beta, A-beta 40 being the most common, but there are slightly longer forms of A-beta, in particular A-beta 42, that have been demonstrated to be more amyloidogenic. And so it has been a goal for the field to understand the details of this process of APP uh, cleavage uh, by secretases uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that we might be able to intervene and perhaps uh, uh, either control the overall uh, formation of A-beta or in particular tip the isoform dis distribution towards the less uh, amyloidogenic species. So um, th this is George Pantelopoulos, whose, whose work I am featuring in, in uh, the talk today is a very talented graduate student in the group and, and most of the more inspired art on my slides uh, is that of George. So um, here is again this, this overview of the uh, uh, non-amyloidogenic pathway and uh, amyloidogenic pathways cleavage by alpha secretase of APP or initially beta secretase and then subsequently gamma secretase to liberate A beta. And this slide I'm showing because it uh, highlights a, uh, a, a thought or sort of a, a consensus uh, in thinking about where the alpha secretase protein and the beta secretase protein uh, live in membrane. It's uh, largely believed that alpha secretase is found in, in plasma membrane, that it associates with, uh, with regions of membrane where there's lower cholesterol uh, presence and uh, more liquid disordered uh, membrane, whereas beta secretase and gamma secretase are often conjectured to be found concentrated in uh, regions of protein that are higher in cholesterol content that form uh, liquid ordered or RAF domains. And it has been proposed that this partitioning of uh, the APP uh, substrate uh, between regions of more liquid disordered or liquid ordered RAF domain might be important in the overall processing of A-beta. And that is that if APP was more highly directed towards liquid ordered domains that are where you might find beta secretase and gamma secretase that you might see higher amyloidogenic processing, whereas if there were mutations or other changes uh, in, the, in, in the cell, you might uh, see these APP uh, more enriched in uh, lower regions of cholesterol and uh, liquid disorder, disordered regions in the plasma membrane and perhaps see more non-amyloidogenic processing. And this uh, also suggests that uh, the overall level of cholesterol that might create more uh, at higher cholesterol, create more liquid ordered regions uh, where you could concentrate then uh, beta secretase, gamma secretase uh, might be uh, one explanation for the correlation between increased cholesterol levels and uh, production of A beta. Um, and this, this slide is showing uh, where these membranes uh, are found uh, within the cell. Uh, and again, using the same color coding, we're showing these liquid ordered uh, and more uh, cholesterol rich regions as opposed to uh, cholesterol poor regions. And to emphasize that it's not simply the membrane, but also the, uh, uh, the surrounding uh, uh, the, the surrounding solvation, uh, where you can see very significant changes in pH that have also been proposed to play an important role, and that I'll talk a little bit about later, uh, as well as uh, regions of, um, of liquid disordered and liquid ordered regions or RAF domains, where you might see a competition or partitioning of, uh, of a substrate like uh, APP between these regions, and then again in a way that might correlate with the overall level of processing. 
So uh, there are a number of conjectures have come uh, out of, of studies of the C99 protein uh, in membrane and, and micelle. The, the group of Char Charles Sanders at Vanderbilt has done beautiful work using NMR spectroscopy to uh, demonstrate that there could be a specific binding site for cholesterol on C99 protein that might be important uh, in its processing and, and possibly even in, in cholesterol regulation. Um, it has been proposed that cholesterol may play a role in, in binding to APP in a way that staples uh, uh, APP in the juxtamembrane region that uh, to control the point of cleavage by gamma secretase in a way that correlates with enhancing A beta 40 um, production. Uh, the use of statins that can uh, control the overall level of cholesterol that is available. Uh, there's been recent work that suggests that statins might reduce processing of, of APP um, by beta secretase and then resulting in, in enhanced APP dimer formation. Uh, again, suggesting a role for, uh, for cholesterol, either directly or indirectly, um, in, in the amyloidogenic processing of APP. And uh, it's uh, also been proposed recently, and interestingly, that, that APP itself might play a role in nucleating and stabilizing the formation of RAF domains. And so uh, in our uh, group and in collaboration with with Dave Thurumalai, uh, we have been looking at a number of these conjectures and trying to uh, test the potential role of direct interaction of cholesterol with the APPC99 and also uh, the conjectures that uh, relate amyloidogenic or non-amyloidogenic processing with, uh, with domains, with membrane domains and protein partitioning between domains. So um, some earlier work uh, in, in our group by, by Laura Dominguez, who is now at, the, uh, at uh, UNAM in, in Mexico and is one of the co-organizers with, with Jennifer Lee of the exciting uh, amyloid symposium that's coming up shortly at the ACS meeting at the beginning of April. Um, did some lovely work uh, using a multi-scale uh, simulation methodology where we tend to couple initially coarse grain simulations using a force field like the Martini force field uh, to initially see this, uh, the organization of the system, in this case, the C99 protein in a DPC micelle or in a bilayer. And then after uh, achieving that, uh, that more exhaustive sampling using the coarse grain model, we'll often switch to an all atom model and then be able by building out the, from the coarse grain structures and then characterize the structure and energetics in more detail. And uh, Laura's work uh, was able to demonstrate a few things. One is that there's a very significant, uh, can be significant differences in both the monomeric form of APP and the dimer. Uh, whether you're in micelle uh, or membrane, suggesting that important role for simulation in refining uh, NMR structures that originate in, uh, in micelle, but also in characterizing the structure of the transmembrane region and the importance of this short N helix uh, that is found in the, in the juxtamembrane region, I'll refer to a bit more uh, in, in a few moments. So that work, uh, the early work was uh, on simulating C99 was done with truncated peptides in part because those had been used in, um, in some of the experimental studies. But uh, George Pantelopoulos in collaboration with Yuji Sugita's group at, uh, at, at, at Riken in Japan uh, carried out the first simulations of the full length of C99 protein. And uh, in that initial work, uh, George used an implicit solvent uh, model of the, of the membrane uh, to, and replica exchange molecular dynamics in a way that was uh, allowed us to see significant sampling of, uh, of not just the transmembrane region, but particularly this N-terminal and C-terminal regions that are highly disordered and yet can take on what we believe might be important structure. So, 
Uh, this slide, uh, the take home message here is simply that when in looking at a variety of membrane thicknesses, uh, we can see significant differences in the structural ensemble of, of C99 and in particular differences in the, the tilt angle as, as you would expect, but also the relative orientation of the, uh, of the N-terminal helix. Uh, compared to the, the transmembrane, uh, transmembrane helix. Um, and this work, which, which as I mentioned, was published in, in 2018, this is a summarizing slide uh, showing the location of a number of critical FAD, uh, familial Alzheimer's disease mutations, and also some regions that are important uh, to C99 dimerization and post-translational modification that this work was allowed us to uh, characterize the structure of those regions uh, that in a way that can be important in, um, in understanding how uh, sequence might affect the structure of the protein and perhaps post-translational modifications that can be essential in its, uh, in its function. And uh, intriguingly, uh, uh, George was able to identify uh, a region in the, the N-terminal region where there was significant beta structure that could be formed. And this suggests that this potentially could be uh, a nucleation site for beta formation at the membrane uh, interface that, that could be catalyzed by the presence of, of C99. So in, in modeling the uh, complexity or the heterogeneity in membrane, there are a variety of, uh, of lipids, unsaturated lipids that are typically associated with disordered regions in the membrane, and then saturated lipids where you see higher density, more ordered regions, and of course, cholesterol. Um, as uh, the work, beautiful work from Sarah Keller's group, as demonstrated, uh, you can see phase separation in, in ternary and other lipid mixtures uh, that allow us to create models for the liquid ordered or RAF domains that one might find in a cellular membrane. And uh, these regions tend to be thicker and uh, enriched in cholesterol in the ordered regions. And then they're the liquid disordered regions. And when we're thinking about whether a protein partitions into one of these regions or another, we're often thinking very simply, uh, a lot of the theoretical modeling is really thinking very simply in terms of hydrophobic mismatch, the overall length of the, of the hydrophobic re transmembrane region and how that meets the thickness of the membrane, which of course can vary as you're varying the overall cholesterol levels. So um, Glenn uh, uh, Feigenson's uh, uh, group and, uh, has done a, a great deal of work characterizing uh, the role of cholesterol concentration in liquid fit and uh, lipid phase behavior. But uh, George, George Pantelopoulos uh, has, has a, a very nice paper in Biophysical Journal where he characterized over quite a broad range of uh, cholesterol concentration, a variety of lipid phases uh, which are summarized here on, on this slide, but the variety of lipid phases that can be observed depending on the, the overall level of cholesterol, um, the cholesterol that, that one finds in the cell. Um, cholesterol can affect the organization of lipids, like the, the, uh, uh, in the formation of, of, of phase separation and domains, but cholesterol can also self-organize into aggregates. And uh, this had been previously observed, but a, a talented uh, graduate student in our group, Asanga Bandara, carried out a study in 2017, demonstrating that you can see long-lived stable cholesterol dimers uh, that can form in membrane. And in some beautiful work by Matt Elkins and Mei Hong, uh, at, at MIT using state-of-the-art solid-state NMR spectroscopy, uh, those cholesterol dimers and in fact uh, tetramers as well have been uh, structurally identified and observed in membrane uh, for the first time experimentally uh, in, in a detailed way uh, as, was, uh, 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 no, as is discussed in this, in this recent paper. 
Um, when we're thinking then about the role of cholesterol, we have cholesterol aggregates, we have phase separated membrane. Um, there are studies that clearly demonstrate that in the processing of C99, the thickness of the membrane uh, can control the uh, overall uh, production of A-beta uh, uh, 40, but also uh, the um, relative amount of these longer isoforms. And so uh, this study from uh, 2012 suggests that for thicker membranes uh, that are formed, that you maximize the A-beta 40 production and minimize the 42 to 43 production, um, which uh, demonstrates, a, uh, demonstrates a, a role for the membrane thickness in, in the C99 processing. And uh, we know that when we're thinking about regions of, of thicker membrane, this is often associated with the liquid order domains and the, the, the creation of the liquid order domains is something that depends on higher levels of cholesterol. And so we can uh, imagine as this slide uh, demonstrates that in uh, conditions of lower cholesterol under 10 mole percent, you might see a predominance of liquid disordered regions, and, and that might mean that you would have more non-amyloidogenic uh, cleavage of APP by alpha secretase, as opposed to when you see higher uh, levels of cholesterol uh, that, would favor, uh, that would favor the amyloidogenic processing. So those are uh, ideas that, uh, as to how the overall membrane structure might affect the processing of C99 uh, in a general way in terms of the phase, uh, phase domains forming the thickness of the membrane. But as I mentioned earlier, it's also been proposed that there can be specific binding of cholesterol to C99. And so this, uh, this uh, work by this, the Sanders lab from uh, 2013 uh, was able to quantify that binding and to show that there's a competitive equilibrium between the dimerization of C99 uh, and then with monomer and then also forming the C99 cholesterol complex. And so we can think that higher levels of cholesterol in the cell would, uh, would push this equilibrium towards the cholesterol C99 complex and minimize the amount of C99, I say here, but or also APP dimerization. So uh, Afra Panahi, who was then a postdoc in, uh, in the lab and is now a professor at University of California at San Marcos, has, did some work using uh, exploring the role of, of pH and, and uh, testing this conjecture about specific binding uh, of cholesterol to, to C99. And, one of the things that she was able to demonstrate is that the pH uh, at the cellular, uh, at, the, at the membrane surface was, uh, played a significant role in, in the formation of this short N-terminal helix. And that short N-terminal helix had been uh, indicated as being important in forming or completing the cholesterol binding site so that you might see the stabilization of this helix at low pH, which you might find in say an early endosomal or endosomal environment to stabilize the cholesterol binding site. Whereas at higher pH, you might see a more disordered N helix and, that would discourage the specific uh, or tighter binding of, uh, of cholesterol to C99. Um, uh, George Pantelopoulos uh, has recently returned to this, uh, this, this question of the uh, binding of C99 to, uh, uh, to cholesterol, and in particular to look at a number of different charge states of the C99 to build on and, and test the ideas that came out of Offer's uh, earlier work. As part of that, he also um, returned to this, this very, uh, this lovely work, uh, earlier work by the Sanders group um, characterizing how the interactions of cholesterol and, and C99 can vary as a function of a mole percent of cholesterol. And uh, what one finds is that there are uh, moderate interactions or strong interactions that are indicated by the colors of these particular residues. And that 
whether the residues interact strongly with cholesterol or also uh, moderately, you can see that they are not, uh, they are not uh, confined to any given uh, interface of, of C99, but actually are distributed around the, uh, around the transmembrane helix. In addition, if you look at the KD that had been measured uh, in, in the 2013 paper uh, from the Sanders lab, it's suggesting that there is a binding that's uh, it's about two kcals per mole, which of course is not uh, a very, very tight binding and suggests a, a, a weaker association. So the idea from that data that uh, as some uh, subsequent studies have proposed that cholesterol is sort of being stapled to C99 in a specific binding site, uh, some of this experimental data uh, argues, against, argues against that type of uh, interpretation. So to explore this further, uh, George carried out uh, much more extensive sampling than we were able to do in our 2016 study. And this work was published last year in, in Journal of Physical Chemistry B. Thank you, Joan. Uh, and uh, what, jo what uh, George was able to find in, in these studies uh, is that he was able to characterize the, uh, well, first of all, the overall structure of C99, the transmembrane helix, and then this short and terminal helix, and how that uh, structure varies with different mole percents of, of cholesterol. But then he was also able to characterize the nature of the uh, longest lived cholesterol C99 complexes. And so we actually see sort of a power law distribution of, uh, of uh, binding times or residence times. And when selecting out these longest lived states, those that are uh, living over 25 nanoseconds or bound over 25 nanoseconds, you can carry out a structural um, analysis and uh, and look for contacts between the cholesterol and 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 C99. And so this slide shows the four systems that George studied. Uh, one is the uh, the wild type protein. Um, another is uh, is that protein with uh, but where we would imagine at a at a higher pH uh, state. And then um, where we would have a ionized uh, aspartate at, um, at like 23. And then looking at two familial Alzheimer's disease mutants, where you're taking either uh, the glutamate or aspartate at residues 22 and 23 and substituting those with polar residues. And um, this is showing in brighter red, the interfaces that uh, show the most strong correlation with uh, or contact with cholesterol. And as you can see um, in this case, uh, where we're looking at, uh, at, this, uh, at this ionized state of, of D23, we actually see, I should say, um, as I haven't mentioned, that on the transmembrane helix, there are some uh, key glycine residues. There's a GXXXG uh, repeat motif. Uh, and this was the interface that had been proposed based on a, uh, a computational and experimental studies as being the binding interface for interaction with cholesterol. And that's shown in each of these, each of these uh, figures by an arrow. Uh, what we can see is that depending on the state of the protein, the particular sequence or the, uh, the pH, that, uh, that we can see different interfaces that are playing, playing a role. Um, so this uh, work, along with the analysis of the experimental data, really suggests uh, or argues against a very strong specific binding of cholesterol to C99. And then and as such argues in favor of a less direct mechanism for the impact of cholesterol on C99 structure and also processing, one where C99 is affecting the, uh, the membrane environment through the formation of phase, uh, then that, that affects uh, the C99 uh, partitioning and localization. So I know I, I'm almost I'm almost out of time, but I want to tell one short story at the end about the, the looking at the role of 
protein partitioning with APP C99. So what I mentioned earlier uh, in thinking about the role of the overall role of cholesterol in the cell and membrane domains was that there is a prevailing uh, thought that C99 is protein and that APP tends to be localized in lipid, lipid RAF domains where you have higher cholesterol and, and more ordered, uh, ordered phase. And uh, in 2016, the Sanders group, and then more recently, uh, Ann Kenworthy uh, with Charles Sanders uh, in this very interesting bioarchive uh, paper, have looked at C99, but in the earlier study, other proteins that were strongly believed to partition to liquid ordered regions of the membrane and found in this study, in fact, that all of these proteins would localize in liquid disordered regions, contrary to the prevailing, uh, prevailing thinking. And so we have uh, initially tried to, uh, to explore those ideas, uh, to taking a number of different transmembrane proteins where there was a sense that they would partition to a liquid ordered or a liquid disordered region. And we tried to explore the partitioning uh, directly using uh, the Martini, uh, the Martini coarse grain model. And what we discovered in this work, which a number of other groups uh, have discovered as well, is that the, Mar the standard Martini model has a pathology that uh, it tends to overstabilize protein aggregates. And uh, worse than, than that, it also tended to um, be unable to identify in proteins where the, it was uh, the, the localization in either liquid ordered regions or liquid disordered regions were known from experiment that we uh, often found a lack of correlation between the regions of experimental localization and where the simulated protein would be found in the membrane. So we, uh, for a time, gave up on the use of the coarse grain modeling in, uh, in exploring the protein partitioning question. And we appealed to uh, all atom molecular dynamics with a large uh, Anton allocation. And this was work from George Panelopoulos and Asanga Bandara. We started with two C99 proteins in a disordered uh, ternary lipid mixture of saturated, unsaturated lipids and cholesterol and watched the de novo phase separation and partitioning of C99 uh, over about 20 microseconds. And what we found was in some ways consistent with the Sanders uh, group's observations, and that is that C99 tended to be largely surrounded by uh, unsaturated lipids, but we always found that the protein was localized at the membrane, uh, at the domain interface, the interface between the liquid disordered and the liquid ordered regions. So what uh, this study though, I have to say is a, for our lab is a heroic effort to be able to look at this protein partitioning. And if you wanted to have more detailed free energy calculations, it's really beyond the reach of all atom simulation at this time to, uh, to uh, do that successfully. And so um, we've uh, stepped back a bit and reparameterized the Martini model to put the Martini model in a position to be able to address these questions related to protein partitioning and, and the membrane phase separation. And so Ian Majumder is a very talented graduate student, second year student in our group recently uh, use the Martini 2.2 model to look at uh, the homodimer formation in four different transmembrane proteins, including C99, where there was information uh, from typically from FRET experiments as to what the binding free energy would be. And you can see the experimental values compared with the results from the standard Martini model, where we're looking at the center of mass separation between the two proteins. In a, a simulation of eight proteins of glycophorin A, the standard Martini model gives you one out aggregate. So by doing a very simple reparameterization of the lipid protein interaction, just by slightly upscaling the uh, Leonard Jones uh, well depth to, to further stabilize the lipid protein interaction, we stabilize the monomers 
and then in doing so uh, can bring the equilibrium of for binding for these four transmembrane protein homodimers uh, to agree within one kcal per mole of the known experimental values. And then in, in carrying in repeating the simulation with this reparameterized Martini force field, what Ian was able to observe is a dynamic equilibrium of the formation of monomers and dimers that can associate and separate consistent with the, the scale of the interactions that are known experimentally. And so, um, so in our future work, our current work uh, in the group, we are uh, working now again with uh, our multi-scale model with an improved Martini model for coarse grain simulations. And we're working to extend uh, our studies of the role of membrane and protein partitioning and direct interaction with the transmembrane region of C99 to transmembrane models of transmembrane regions of both alpha secretase and beta secretase, which includes uh, post-translational lipidation of beta secretase to further explore the prevailing conjectures about the role of uh, membrane domain and partitioning these proteins and impacting a beta. Uh, uh, a beta production. And so uh, a thanks uh, again to members of my group, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. So I think to keep us time, it was a lovely talk. Thank you. Uh, and I think we're going to just stick to a few questions. And then the questions that you don't have time to answer right now, you can answer at the very end of the session. Right. So. Um, the first question is um, from Charlie Brooks. And the question is, are the proteins restrained to helical structure? Also, how are concentration effects treated in the association simulations? OK, so uh, th uh, thanks for coming, Charlie. And uh, perhaps you're referring to the coarse grain martini simulations. And so in the, in the coarse grain, Martini simulations, you have a bias or uh, restraints in the secondary structure. And so that's a significant shortcoming of, uh, of modeling uh, proteins with Martini. Um, uh, so better coarse grain models of proteins, such as the self-organized polymer model developed in the Therumali group would be better at that. Uh, uh, but in the cases of these transmembrane proteins, it's known the transmembrane regions are quite stable and helical. And so in this reparameterization of Martini, uh, I don't believe that the secondary structure restraints are, are quite as much of a problem. Of course, we'd rather, uh, we would rather uh, uh, remove those. In all of the all-atom simulations, there were no restraints at all in, in terms of the secondary uh, structure, so only in the coarse grain simulations. Thank you. So uh, we have uh, two other questions that we have time for. The first is by an anonymous attendee, and the question is, why are there so many isoforms of A-beta? Isn't the enzyme specific, and which isoform is most abundant? Oh, okay. So um, thanks for that question. So the, the, um, the most abundant isoform is typically the 40 amino acid form of A-beta. Um, I mentioned that gamma secretase carries out a processive cleavage. So there is actually an, a, an initiation site that is uh, uh, at, at a point on, in this uh, C-terminal end of the transmembrane helix. An initiation site for cleavage, gamma secretase is an aspartyl protease, and it, it cleaves the transmembrane helix and then continues in three amino acid bites until it terminates. And, and no one really understands what is controlling the point of initiation or the point of uh, uh, where the cleavage ends. But uh, because of that, uh, because of variations in the processive cleavage, it might take one bite less or a bite more, you end up with varying isoforms. So gamma secretase, gamma secretase cleaves 40 or more substrates. And in some cases, uh, as in the 
in the cleavage of notch, there's high fidelity in terms of the length of the product. And in, in the case of cleaving APP, there's a lack of fidelity. And, uh, and this is believed, as I mentioned earlier, to play potentially play a significant role in, um, in the uh, Alzheimer's disease. But the, it's a very good question. And I think uh, now that there are, good cryo, there are good cryo EM and computational model structures of gamma secretase, uh, we're going to gain insight into the mechanism of the enzyme and hopefully we'll be able to answer, answer your question. Thank you. So uh, John, there are two other questions by Matthias Bach and Danilo Milardi, but I'm gonna save them for the end because Great. we need to move on. So Matthias and Danilo, I'm gonna promote you to uh, the panel at the very end of uh, the session. So we're gonna move now to our second talk by Professor Yuji Goto. So Yuji um, received his bachelor, master's and doctoral degrees from uh, Osaka University. He then um, spent uh, several years in different countries um, doing postdoctoral research. Uh, he was, for example, at UC uh, Santa Cruz as a research fellow. Um, after that, he returned uh, to Japan where he took a position at Osaka University and he's currently the specially appointed professor Global Center for Medical Engineering and Informatics at Osaka University. And I think we all know Professor Goto's fantastic work uh, on protein folding and on amyloid formation. And we're very excited to hear uh, your talk, Eugene. I'll turn it over to you now. So the, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so the I start. Anyway, the it's my great pleasure the, to attend this uh, fantastic uh, uh, seminar. The I'm uh, today the going to talk about the just a, a simple the equation which uh, combine protein folding and uh, amyloid uh, formation. And uh, you know, the, the title is uh, super saturation barrier and something like that. And uh, so the, I use uh, this uh, so uh, snake puzzle cube. You see, this is the, I should uh, just a moment. Okay. So the, so the, this is the unfolded protein. Uh, so represented by the snake uh, puzzle cube. And uh, if protein uh, protein falls, this is a native state, and there might be intermediate, and uh, this is definitely uh, uh, so uh, amyloid fibers. So this uh, uh, puzzle uh, represents uh, uh, protein folding and uh, amyloid formation pretty well, and uh, I use uh, this uh, simple model to. Uh, 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 so the how the protein folding and the amyloid formations are linked. Uh, so the you see this kind of the so the image of the linking the protein folding and aggregation. We see a lot, and uh, lots of the so final images uh, we see. However, I would say the. All are the just uh, qualitative. The question is: uh, Is it possible to uh, formulate the linkage of folding and amyloid formation? Uh, so, do you think about that? I never thought about uh, until the a couple of years ago. The, the answer is yes. 
and uh, equation linking protein folding and amyloid formation is quite uh, straight, not so uh, difficult. And uh, to show that uh, equation, I talk about the supersaturation and the thermodynamics and the heating and the agitation dependent amyloid formation and the generality of the heating and the agitation dependent amyloid formation. So the, the first, uh, uh, we recognize the importance of the supersaturation when the, we use the ultrasonication the, to uh, induce, to accelerate the amyloid formation. Uh, the protein was a uh, beta to microglobulin associated with uh, dialysis related amyloidosis. So 2005 or something like that. So the previously, we used the ultrasonication to prepare the amyloid uh, uh, seeds uh, to break the preformed uh, seeds to make a shorter uh, fibril uh, seeds, which is efficient uh, to induce the uh, seed dependent uh, fiber formation, as you know. And uh, at the same time, the, we a one that such an ultrasonication might be useful to induce uh, uh, spontaneous uh, fiber formation without uh, seeding. And uh, we check the effect of the ultrasonication. Without ultrasonication, under the acidic conditions, we use the pH 2.5, where the acid denatured uh, beta 2 microglobulin is stable for. Uh, several uh, days, a week or so. And uh, seeding induced the efficient uh, amyloid formation within a, a couple of hours. And the same was true when we agitated a uh, solution by the ultrasonication. So the uh, ultrasonic irradiation the induced the fiber formation uh, at uh, two hours, which is uh, monitored, which was monitored by sulfurabin T fluorescence or the light scattering and uh, demonstrated by AFM images. So the, we got a kind of the convincing idea that the uh, amyloid precipitate above the solubility and the supersaturation limits the precipitation something like uh, just as uh, 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 general solutes uh, 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 come out as uh, crystals above solubility by breaking the supersaturation. So the, I think, uh, uh, so this is a uh, uh, image of the supersaturation. And uh, this is a so-called the echo chiro and a handy heater uh, in which uh, eight molar sodium acetate is in it. And uh, once you click the metal tip, uh, which induced the quite strong agitation, you can make the, uh, so the, the crystals of the sodium acetate at the same time, the heat comes out. So the, this one is used for a handy heater. And uh, this is an uh, interesting uh, uh, kind of the uh, scientific uh, demonstration. So the, uh, once uh, you broke, uh, break the uh, supersaturation by agitation, uh, uh, phase transition occurs from the supersaturated solution to the solid. Uh, solid, uh, so uh, sodium acetate at eight mora is really strong. And uh, it can be back to the solution just by heating because uh, solubility is pretty high at 100 degrees Celsius. Then the, you can return back to the supersaturated solution. So the, this is a, uh, just a simple uh, example of the uh, supersaturation. 
But as you know, the, this kind of the phenomena uh, uh, happen in our body as a, a stone formation, uh, like a, a kidney stone, which is a calcium oxalate, and the gall stone, cholesterol, gold, uh, sodium urate. So the super saturation is not so, uh, uh, so uh, unusual. And uh, what is uh, interesting is uh, this kind of the phase transition happens even for uh, denatured proteins. The, uh, this kind of the phase transition for the native proteins, as you know, the uh, crystallization, crystal formation for X-ray crystallography, you know, the, so the, this kind of the results uh, reminds uh, uh, us the importance of the uh, super saturation. The idea is not so new. So the uh, quite old uh, uh, research is suggested the importance of the uh, super saturation for understanding the uh, prion disease and the amyloid diseases uh, in general, amyloid formation. So the, we are very much interested in uh, structures uh, amyloid structures are getting uh, clear uh, for a variety of the proteins. But uh, this kind of the results, we uh, emphasize. Uh, so different view is important as well. So the amyloid fibers are formed because the uh, concentration is above the solubility of the uh, amyloidogenic proteins. So amyloid uh, supersaturation limited pre-state of denatured protein uh, formed above solubility by breaking supersaturation. So the, this is just a general phase diagram of a solute depending on concentration and uh, depending on the precipitant concentration. Uh, you can think about the uh, uh, protein native state a monocrystal formation. If you add it a salt, like a ammonium sulfate, a protein concentration, you know, the solubility decrease. And uh, if you start at a particular concentration, uh, it form the, it uh, uh, exceeds the solubility limit. And then the, it form the crystals uh, after the super saturation. And uh, if you increase the driving force of the uh, uh, precipitation, you observe the amorphous aggregates. And what's important, what is important is a uh, supersaturation region is divided into metastable region, region two, where the seeding is necessary, required uh, to form amido, uh, no crystals without seeding. So supersaturation uh, is supposed to be a uh, continued uh, uh, forever. Label region without uh, uh, seeding. So the after a uh, lag time, uh, um, uh, no, uh, 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 crystals uh, form. Our uh, idea is as the same is true for amyloid fibers. And uh, so the, this is uh, 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 just an image. So the, if the uh, protein's uh, conformation is unique, it forms the uh, crystals above solubility. Uh, but the conformation is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, flexible, uh, 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 large, like the uh, denatured proteins. Uh, maybe uh, they form amorphous aggregates above solubility limits. And uh, at a certain range of the conformational uniqueness, uh, they form the uh, amyloids uh, before the uh, amorphous aggregates uh, form. So the first important is uh, uh, supersaturation. Uh, supersaturation barrier should be uh, broken to form the crystals as well as amyloids. And uh, I talk about the uh, thermodynamic a uh, little bit. So the uh, 
uh, previously the amorphous aggregates are quite uh, uh, difficult to study the thermodynamics. But uh, now the, it is possible to characterize the thermodynamics enthalpy entropy of the amyloid formation. Our experiment, one example is something like that. So the into a uh, cubet of the ITC, isothermal titration calorimetry, you added the uh, salt to decrease the solubility of the protein. Protein here is uh, denatured uh, beta 2m. And uh, after a certain uh, uh, addition, uh, several additions of the salt, we incubate. After a period, we see a strong heat burst, like uh, echo chiral, as just uh, uh, showed. From this kind of the results, uh, we confirmed the heat is enthalpy of the phase transition. And uh, we succeeded in accurately measuring the heat or burst. We performed uh, this kind of the experiments uh, 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 carefully, and we can characterize the, the enthalpy of the amyloid formation, which is uh, indicated by red uh, marks. And uh, the point is, uh, which is uh, comparable with that of the native protein folding, something like that. And uh, based on this kind of the results, we can do the kind of the thermodynamics of the protein folding as well as the so amyloid formation as well as the protein folding. And the fact is uh, suggested, uh, indicated is uh, like the case of the protein uh, cold denaturation, the amyloid may cold denature as well as uh, heat denatures. And uh, indeed, uh, we observe the uh, core denaturation, which is most uh, clearly shown by the alpha side nuclei, but uh, uh, same may be true for other amyloid fibers. So this is, uh, you know, the uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the same uh, phase diagram I suggested. Usually the uh, solutes like uh, uh, native proteins, but the uh, salts, uh, uh, decrease the solubility uh, uh, upon decreasing the temperature. But uh, in case of proteins, protein solubility decrease upon increasing the temperature. Uh, that is uh, because of the hydrophobic interactions. And the further increase in temperature, uh, again, uh, increase the solubility of the protein that is because of the conformation entropy of the main chain. Uh, because of that, we see this kind of the uh, phase diagram, uh, core denaturation and heat denaturation in case of the uh, uh, amyloid fibers. And uh, so the, uh, uh, then the heating and agitation dependent uh, amyloid formation. So the, to monitor the uh, heating dependent uh, amyloid formation, as well as the effect of the agitation, we just uh, uh, use uh, simple the fluorometer, uh, fluorometer. but uh, fluorometer uh, uh, cells, uh, we uh, 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 use uh, agitation as well as the temperature control. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, we use the uh, ultrasonicator directly attached to the cell of the uh, fluorometer uh, to uh, monitor the effect of the ultrasonication. And the fact we observe is, uh, as you remember, the fluorescent spectrum, uh, we observe the light scattering of the instant beam. That is uh, usually the, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, for 47 nanometer or something like that to excite the cyflavin T. And the cyflavin T fluorescence uh, definitely monitor the formation of the amyloid fibers. The scattering uh, monitor the sum of the total aggregate, including the amorphous aggregates. So uh, in the case of the temperature scan, we increase the temperature and uh, we, we, we after uh, 
uh, certain temperature, we cool down. And uh, this axis, time axis, is uh, it changed to the temperature axis. And uh, then the, we see the amyloid formation at the highest uh, temperature for some proteins, as shown uh, you below. So this is a case of the beta-2 microglobin. Uh, so the at neutral pH, uh, the same experiments uh, uh, we reported for the under the acidic conditions. So beta-2 uh, microglobin uh, uh, refold, unfold, reversible, uh, without agitation, uh, monitored by the first, I should say uh, this one, monitored by the cyflavin T fluorescence or the light scattering, nothing happens, nothing happens. And uh, when we uh, monitor the heat effect, heating by the CD spectrum, circular dichroids, uh, uh, beta 2M or native state uh, shows the uh, just a tiny CD spectrum upon unfolding the intensity increase we just uh, observe the reverse unfolding, uh, just uh, skipping, the, uh, and uh, uh, it comes to this point. But uh, under the agitation, uh, in this case, starting, so the here, the so the at around the 70 degrees Celsius, sulfurabin uh, 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 T fluorescence increase uh, dramatically and the light scattering increase. So this kind of the effect uh, uh, results uh, we obtain. So the without uh, quiescent conditions, unfolding is reversible. But uh, upon agitation, uh, uh, maybe supersaturation uh, was broken to form the amyloid fibers. Amyloid fibers are something like that. So the, here, the, 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 the we come to these uh, uh, equations. And the equation is in fact not so uh, uh, complicated, just simple. So this side, you see native denatured, native unfolded. And uh, you can uh, uh, obtain uh, this kind of the uh, uh, equation for fraction of the native state. And for the amyloid fibers, so the, this is just a simple, uh, 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 the most simple equation mechanism. So uh, polymer, uh, if you add it uh, uh, monomer, uh, the amyloid extent, but the uh, polymer uh, concentration doesn't change. So that the uh, equilibrium constant, polymer uh, equilibrium constant is uh, monomer concentration uh, at the uh, 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 after breaking the supersaturation or the equilibrium uh, concentration. This is uh, something like a critical micelle concentration. And I think uh, basically, I believe this equation fold for the amyloid uh, formation. This is a monomer uh, solid or the solubility of the uh, solutes. So the now, could you combine these two equations? Uh, I thought it might be a little bit tough, but in fact, that is quite simple. And uh, before the breakdown of the supersaturation, this equation uh, 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 hold. And uh, this equation, you remember, when you work with protein folding, you don't think about the protein concentration. And uh, of course, uh, dimeric protein depends on protein concentration, but usually the, we, we, we so the study the uh, protein folding, assuming that the monomeric transition is independent of the protein concentration. But this side definitely dependent on protein concentration. And if you combine these, and the uh, results is simple. Something like uh, uh, this solubility is dominantly important. And uh, 
remaining monomers uh, may equilibrate with a native state. And the native state solubility definitely higher than that of the uh, denatured state. So the, here, the, uh, I show the image with uh, uh, this uh, uh, cartoon. And uh, super saturation, the final frontier in protein science. So the, what you are seeing is an amyloid burst of the amyloid A beta. And the native state is a cubic. And the denatured state is extended. And the amyloids are uh, accumulated. And the relationship of uh, two states are something like that. And uh, under the conditions of the supersaturation, that's how uh, we, we, we discuss the protein folding with, uh, without uh, considering the protein concentration. And uh, once you break the supersaturation, uh, suppose the solubility of the uh, denatured state is, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, solubility of the denatured state is uh, one. And uh, previously, the uh, solubility of the denatured state is five. And uh, I think uh, uh, it works. No? Okay, it's going. So the final stage is 118. And the uh, solubility of the denatured state uh, is defined uh, by the critical concentration. And the native state, because uh, we started at the midpoint of the transition, uh, native state molecule is one. Uh, under the uh, supersaturation, native state is five, denatured state is uh, five. Uh, so that one is so the, uh, explained by this uh, simple equation. And uh, so the, uh, this is uh, the same equations I showed. And uh, this side, protein folding is independent of protein concentration. That is quite important. And the amyloid formation depends on protein concentration. Once you broke the supersaturation, what is important is critical concentration, solubility. And the solubility, uh, uh, if you uh, work at the midpoint of the uh, native state uh, unfolding, uh, denatured state, uh, native state is equal, but uh, uh, important uh, factor is uh, 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 solubility. So the outcome is quite interesting. As I mentioned, we started at the midpoint of the transition, that's around the uh, 60 degrees Celsius. And once you break the super saturation, 90% uh, is amyloid, and that native state is just a 10%. That means the apparent decrease in stability of the native state by breaking the supersaturation. And uh, so the uh, starting from the native state, supersaturated state, if you uh, form the amyloid fibers, native state apparently destabilized very much. And uh, so the, this is a summary of what I talked about. So the, how general this kind of the observation. And uh, uh, we started uh, to check the generality with a variety of the proteins, short peptide and uh, even IDP. And uh, so just... Uh, uh, moment. And uh, so the, these uh, colors, different colors, yellow or magenta and the blue are different uh, results. And uh, proteins, amino acid residues, molecular weight, PI, and hydrophobicity, and the proteins, the concentration we used, pH. 
and uh, something like that. And uh, so the the proteins are something like that. And uh, uh, based on the results, I say S protein, S type proteins, strictly super saturation limited uh, proteins, like uh, beta 2M I just showed, no agitation, reversible unfolding, and agitation, amyloid fibers. So the, these proteins, uh, uh, beta 2M, uh, in addition, the uh, immunoglobulin domains, ubiquitin, alpha cytonucleine, this is a IDP, lysozyme, transthyretin, uh, alpha lactalbumin, and the ribonuclease A. This is a typical amphenzenza protein. Ribonuclease A is extensively studied uh, under the reversible unfolding uh, conditions. This is a quite soluble protein. But even for ribonuclease A, upon heating to induce unfolding and agitation, we can see amyloid fibers. And uh, then the, this is a type S protein results, and the ribonuclease A is here. And uh, uh, second uh, series of uh, proteins is a uh, A type protein. We, uh, to tell the truth, wanted all the proteins uh, behave like this, but uh, some proteins at the high temperature tend to spontaneously form amyloid fibers. We wanted to stop and we wanted to see their kind of exceptions. But uh, now the, we see that is a, a, a reason, that is quite understandable autonomous amyloid forming uh, proteins. And uh, uh, here is IAPP. And uh, uh, with agitations, of course, they form amyloid fibers. But uh, even without amyloid uh, uh, agitation, they tend to form amyloid fibers, uh, like a uh, uh, case of the IAPP. And, uh, uh, and uh, even uh, uh, so uh, quiescent uh, uh, conditions, uh, they form the amyloid fibers at a high temperature. And uh, other proteins, some uh, IDPs, uh, form the amorphous aggregates. And uh, sometimes they contain the uh, amyloid fibers, uh, but the uh, uh, amount of the amyloid uh, fibers are uh, uh, not so much. So the, how do you uh, think this kind of the varieties depending on proteins. Then the, we come back to this, uh, you know, the this rice. And uh, so this is a general phase diagram, driving force increase and the protein solubility decrease. And if you start at a certain uh, protein concentration, you form the crystals. In case of the denatured protein, they form amyloid fibers and amorphous aggregates. Maybe the uh, strictly supersaturation limited proteins are uh, located here. That's a metastable region. And uh, autonomous amyloid uh, forming proteins are here. They are labor region. And uh, boiled egg like proteins are uh, located here. That's a kind of the amorphous aggregates. Then uh, what determines, uh, determines these uh, differences, varieties. And uh, we plotted first the ranks and uh, hydrophobicity here. And uh, sounds like uh, average hydrophobicity versus number of the amino acid residues uh, shows this, this kind of the separation. But uh, probably average hydrophobicity against the uh, conformational entropy of the uh, denatured state uh, may be better. And uh, so the, uh, we uh, discussed the uh, effect of the uh, disulfide bond. Disulfide bonds are important. And uh, something like that. 
maybe the, uh, this uh, phase diagram is determined by the uh, conformational flexibility, conformational entropy of the denatured state. And uh, we need to study more. But uh, that kind of the interpretation uh, exactly explain this kind of the, the differences depending on protein species. So now the, I conclude. Uh, folding and amyloid formation are uh, uh, separated by the supersaturation barrier. And uh, I should say, uh, which persist uh, more than uh, uh, previously thought, uh, barrier is rigid, tight. And the uh, uh, breakdown of supersaturation uh, links the amphenzen's uh, concentration independent protein folding something like this. And uh, by breaking this uh, barrier, you can just uh, think about this kind of the uh, three state mechanism. That is straightforward, not so difficult. And the supersaturation barrier uh, seems uh, that depends on protein, denatured states. Uh, what, what is the important factor? It seems the conformational flexibility of the denatured state may be important. And uh, finally, I acknowledge to these uh, people, uh, collaborators. And uh, so the, the, as uh, was introduced, I retired formally from the uh, Protein Research Institute and uh, I continue my research at a small uh, group of the, we say, May Center of the Osaka University. And the uh, topic I talked about is uh, achievement of the JSPS Core to Core uh, program. That's an international uh, program, including uh, uh, Johannes Bufner, Ot Daniel Otzen, uh, Vittorio Berotti, and uh, Josef Cardos. In, uh, we, uh, I thank to uh, those people. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yuji, for a lovely talk. So uh, what we're going to do now is, uh, given a time, move to the open session. So um, Bikash, if you could promote the people who have questions. Uh, for instance, maybe we can start with Patrick uh, Vanderville, if we could promote him to a, a panelist, and then he can ask his question directly. He is now in the panel. Patrick, okay. go ahead. Patrick, go ahead. Ah, uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Ah, okay, good. Uh, I was curious whether you uh, you show that the um, that the amorphous state and the soluble state is is separated by I don't know, kind of amyloid and a metastable state. And I was curious if there are any cases where you can bypass the amyloid state with seeding or another trick to get it from straight into the amorphous state. So the, so uh, that uh, depends on the situation and uh, amorphous aggregates, uh, as you see in this slice, uh, forms uh, rapidly without a barrier of the supersaturation. And uh, so the amorphous aggregates, however, we observed sometimes uh, work as a, a seeds for uh, amyloid formation. And that depends on the uh, amount. And that sounds like a, a small amount of the amorphous aggregates uh, effective sometimes uh, for inducing the amyloid uh, fibrils. But if the amount of the amorphous aggregates gets a uh, dominance, the end product is definitely the amorphous aggregates. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Um, Bikash, if we could promote um, Ashutosh Tiwari. Yeah, he is there in the panel. Okay, you can go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, first of all, very nice talk. And uh, I was wondering, it's a related question related to the protein concentration uh, playing a major role in formation of uh, 
the amyloid. So could you please comment and tell like in general, if we are going to follow a protein aggregation, is it the protein concentration playing a major role in formation of amyloid versus amorphous or other conditions also play a role uh, like pH and uh, properties of proteins. And you did mention about PDP43 and some other proteins that are predominantly so, okay, so the, that's uh, quite an uh, important aspect. And uh, you are seeing the phase diagram. And uh, uh, so the, at the uh, same uh, concentration, uh, if you uh, go up, do you see my pointer? And uh, yeah. so the, this is uh, uh, so the solubility at a certain uh, solvent conditions. They start to form the amyloid fibers. But if you continue to increase the protein concentration, uh, it uh, comes to the region of the amorphous aggregates. So the uh, changing the protein concentration, you go up at the fixed conditions of the solvent. And if you change the uh, pH or the uh, salt or the even the temperature, uh, starting at a constant uh, protein concentration, you go uh, this vertical direction. So the protein may be soluble until a certain condition. Certain condition might be the, uh, at a, 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 a certain concentration of the salt. And then the, it starts to form the amyloid fibers. But uh, if you increase the salt concentration very much, you form the amorphous aggregates. So this axis might be the temperature. And uh, in case of temperature, uh, first, temperature decrease the uh, solubility of the denatured protein in case of the uh, denatured protein. But uh, if you continue to increase, uh, so the, this uh, side uh, uh, appears in an opposite uh, uh, direction. And uh, solubility again uh, increase because of the conformational entropy of the denatured state. So the, we see cold denaturation and heat denaturation uh, because of the uh, uh, mechanism of the amyloid formation is similar to that of protein folding in terms of the driving force. Is that all right? Yeah, so if I'm understanding you correct, the protein misfolding pathway to formation of amyloid or amorphous can just be manipulated with all other conditions remaining same by altering the protein concentration? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, of course, uh, uh, depends on the proteins, but even for a unique uh, protein, if you change the uh, uh, axis of the phase diagram, you can uh, change the uh, outcome. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, John, we have a question for you from Danilo Milardi. So Danilo, I'll, I'll let you talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, John. It was very interesting talk. Uh, my question is related to the formation of the C99 cholesterol complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As my question is, would it be possible that this lipid peptide complex may act as a C to catalyze for the peptide recruitment at the membrane surface? That's so the principle. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's a very interesting uh, possibility. Uh, there, there's some interest, there was some work in the last year suggesting that the C99 cholesterol complex could play a role in stabilizing, uh, nucleating and the, uh, the growth of and stabilizing these liquid ordered raft domains. And so that would be an indirect 
mechanism potentially to accomplish what you were mentioning and that if you could if C99 was playing a role in extending the life and nucleating the growth of these liquid order domains, and if there was a preference for partitioning to the domain or to the domain interface, then that could be a way of, of recruiting, uh, recruiting the C99. Yes, as a consequence of this, I wonder whether this complex could be a convenient target for a, a, an unusual novel pharmacological approach targeting this complex to disrupt interactions, harmful interactions. What is your opinion on this? I, th I think that's a very intriguing idea. I know that the Sanders group, uh, following on their observations of the binding of cholesterol to C99, they were looking at a variety of cholesterol analogs. So thinking of cholesterol as a scaffold for the development of compounds that might perhaps you know, bind more effectively to C99 and may impact the processing by gamma secretase. And so, um, so that's perhaps that's a bit along the lines of what you were proposing. I don't know the final conclusions of that work, but I know that the, the fact that you see this association of C99 with cholesterol su suggests that you know, modified forms of cholesterol might be good good candidates. But I think we need, you know, we need more studies that can critically test some of these ideas and then really elucidate the role that C99 is, is playing there. But, but that's, a, that's an excellent suggestion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And Yuji, there's a question for you in the Q&A and it's from mm -hmm. an anonymous attendee. So I, I will read it out to you. It says, do you think chaperones can have an effect in amyloid formation upon breaking the supersaturation? So the question is interesting, but uh, I don't have the exact answer. And uh, in terms of the supersaturation, and uh, so chaperone uh, the uh, uh, role, uh, maybe the decreasing the uh, uh, so uh, monomer uh, uh, protein protein concentration uh, below the kind of the solubility. So the supersaturation uh, is a, a kind of the dangerous situation. If you uh, uh, get the those uh, proteins by interacting with uh, chaperones, you can reduce decrease the. Uh, uh, so the excess uh, concentration. And uh, what is interesting, and I don't know, is uh, some uh, chaperones have uh, effects, uh, 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 can break the preformed uh, uh, amyloid fibers. And uh, that is interesting, but uh, that's a point I don't understand because uh, according to uh, my hypothesis of the supersaturation, so the, just a protein concentration is uh, uh, important. You cannot uh, dissolve the preformed uh, amyloid fibers unless monomer concentration is below the uh, solubility. Uh, uh, did you get the point? Yeah, thank you. So yeah, this was from, I, I don't know who asked the question, but I'm sure if they have more questions, they will type it in. Thank you. And so the, we have Bin, Bin Zhu who has his hand up or her hand up. Bin, would you like to ask your question? Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, I'm, I am fascinated by Dr. Gutu's talk, especially your classification of uh, three different classes of amyloid. So my question is, uh, what's your criteria, main criteria for classification of these uh, S, A, B? Is that the length? Is that the uh, conformational entropy uh, changes? So the... So classification depends on uh, experiments. 
And uh, so the experiments are fairly clear. So the S protein doesn't form amyloid fibers without agitation. And the A uh, proteins form amyloid fibers even without agitation. And the B e, e, e proteins tend to form amorphous aggregates. Then the, our suggestion at this moment is this kind of the e, difference uh, may come from the uh, conformational entropy of the denatured state. If the denatured state is uh, 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 so flexible uh, and uh, so uh, large, uh, size may be also important. You cannot make the crystal-like amyloid fibers. On the other hand, if you work with uh, quite a, a small peptide, uh, which is uh, tend to amyloid fibers uh, quite uh, rapidly, like uh, IAPP, you cannot stop the amyloid fiber formation by supersaturation barrier. That's a kind of the labile regions where the uh, uh, crystal solutes form crystals after a certain period of the lag time. And the supersaturation strictly limited proteins uh, uh, kind of the moderate size uh, protein according to this uh, uh, prot. So the, uh, we need further study to, uh, to validate this kind of the idea. And the roles of the disulfide bonds are quite important. Often the case with action of the disulfide bond uh, tend to form the amorphous aggregates for some proteins and something like that. Yeah, I have a further uh, another question related. So I think uh, you uh, you classify B class, which is closest to amorphous uh, aggregate. That's right. So, yeah. So is there any? I'm I'm thinking about like anything uh, application wise, because amorphous aggregate normally people are thinking will be less toxic uh, versus like a uh, uh, aggregate. Is that the, do you think there is any correlation where you know, can correlate these different classes of amyloid relate to cytotoxicity? Toxicity is uh, important, but uh, I have no uh, uh, comment. I have, uh, I don't know the, uh, so the toxicity and uh, these uh, different uh, 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 aggregation types. I have a further, uh, a, a quick question related to, you talk about all these in thermodynamic term. Have, mm -hmm. you, have you thought about anything related to kinetic terms? See, these three different classes of amyloid, whether they aggregate faster or slower related to kinetic term. So the, <clears throat> so this one uh, from the, no, uh, sorry. Uh, so, uh, uh, amorphous aggregates, no uh, supersaturation, no uh, 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 lag phase. So the uh, amorphous aggregates uh, tend to form in a saturating uh, kinetics. And uh, a, a, a type uh, form the amyloids with a lag time. And the S type, of course, uh, uh, with a, a lag time. So the, that's a, a difference in kinetics. And uh, a B type, uh, B, why the no uh, lag time? Uh, seems to me the, because uh, so many the aggregation nucleation happens uh, because of the strong driving force of the uh, precipitation. Uh, might, uh, might be the too many nuclei. Uh, Is that all right? Yeah, thank you so much. This is truly fascinating. Thank you, Ben. So uh, John has a question. That was a beautiful talk, Yuji. I, I was wondering, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but a number of the proteins you were studying form different polymorphs of the amyloid. Mm -hmm. And do you see correlation uh, with the conditions when you're precipitating the amyloid that might direct this to one polymorph or another? 
it is possible. So the, we just uh, monitor the amyloid formation. We don't uh, distinguish the different uh, morphologies or something like that. And uh, if you check carefully this kind of the so phase diagram, uh, some uh, uh, types of the e, e, e amyloids, uh, even with the same protein, might behave S, and uh, others might behave A. And uh, of course, uh, uh, even under the same conditions. And uh, different conditions, even with the same protein, can uh, change the uh, outcome. The, uh, is that all right? Yes, yeah, I think it would be great if you could uh, maybe, or someone could characterize the, the product. Yes. That would be fascinating. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we have uh, two more questions and I, I think we'll then wrap up. Our first one is by uh, Long Chen. Thank you. Uh, that's a really fantastic talk. And my first question is, uh, it is very well known for fabrication for them tau really need a cofactor as a heparin or RNA. Otherwise it's very difficult to, to fabrication even with, uh, with uh, heating or shaking. And but alpha synuclein doesn't seem like it need the heparin or RNA cofactors. So what's your thoughts about why some fibro really need heparin or RNA, how this to relate it to the super solubility in your model? And that's my first question. So the, is that a question to Yuji Goto? Uh, why, like a tall fibrillation, you really need a like cofactor like a heparin and RNA, even you with a uh, heat or with uh, shaking it doesn't need a cofactor, but the other tap doesn't need the same need this cofactor. So the so uh, I'm answering, and the cofactor uh, may change this phase diagram. And uh, you uh, mentioned, if I remember, the alpha side requires heparin. Uh, for amyloid formation. I don't think so. But the alpha synuclein doesn't need a heparin, but a tau doesn't need it. It's like a determinant. So the, those uh, cofactors, uh, according to my so the idea, uh, can change the uh, protein solubility depending on the concentration. And uh, the point uh, uh, I mentioned is, uh, uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> so uh, this is uh, alpha side nuclein. And uh, you see alpha side nuclein can form. Yeah. The data is not so clear. But uh, if you increase the temperature, even for the 80 degree Celsius, they start to form amyloid fibers more rapidly, more strongly than at a lower temperature. That is our interesting finding. So if you want to form the amyloid fibers, uh, dependence on temperature, uh, usually higher temperature uh, promote the amyloid fiber formation for uh, many proteins. So that's uh, my comment. Yeah, thank you. My second question is, uh, you know, in AD is, uh, is also well known as co-pathology because alpha synuclein also is hallmarker, also found in the, you know, the uh, uh, insoluble fraction of AD. And uh, my question is uh, for, uh, do you ever think about, uh, for example, different type of fibro? Uh, the co uh, what's the contribution to each other? For example, if the alpha synuclein and the A beta will be consistent in your fibrillation system, so they will follow one specific uh, type for each other, or they will generate new uh, uh, property of the, your, you know, the fibrillation type, how they no. each other. 
I don't know the e, e, that's uh, beyond my work, but uh, possibilities the uh, alpha side mm -hmm. nuclear and the e beta somehow interact, and uh, so that the so the critical concentration might change, and uh, but the question is uh, you know the do they form the e, e, chimeric uh, mixed uh, amyloid fibers or the, yeah. they form the, uh, yes. Uh, do they form the amyloid fibers consisting of both alpha cyanucleine and the A beta? Mm -hmm. So I don't know the, but uh, it is possible that uh, some uh, amyloid fibers can uh, uh, accelerate, promote the uh, amyloid formation of other proteins uh, somehow the... Uh, yeah. Thank I, you. yeah, thank you for your insightful answers. Thank you so much. Okay, so our final question is from Carmelo. Hi. Uh, nice talk. I appreciate uh, most the thermodynamic approach about this uh, question. Now, my question is the follow. Uh, you use the classic two-state model, native in equilibrium with, uh, with uh, unfolded state. There is, a reason, there is a reason because you not use uh, the uh, lamb ray in the hiring uh, model where it uh, is contemplated uh, the native state uh, with uh, in equilibrium with the unfolded state in the fine in the followed in the followed by an irreversible step so the i don't uh, follow no, uh, I couldn't follow the question, but probably we use a uh, quite a simple two-state model, and uh, you uh, wonder the the uh, validity of this uh, just a simple model. Yeah. The, my answer is uh, this is just a starting point, and uh, my point is uh, even this kind of the simple mechanism can reproduce the, explain uh, lots of the experimental results. And uh, you can uh, use a more complicated, uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, model of protein folding, but uh, I don't think uh, results uh, doesn't change so much. The point is uh, when you work with uh, protein folding, you, uh, 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 without a recognition, uh, assume the uh, concentration independence. But uh, if you work with uh, amyloid fibers, that is definitely concentration dependent phenomenon. And uh, uh, yes. you combine these uh, two reactions, that is uh, simple on the basis of this uh, simple equation. And uh, you can uh, use a more uh, uh, complicated model, but I don't think uh, uh, results change so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Ram. Oh, great talks by both the speakers. I uh, loved it. John, I have a question for you. Um, in your transmembrane domain, the helix seems to be king. Uh, does the kink of the helix play any role on A beta production or dimer formation or the interaction with the cholesterol and, and things like that? Can you comment on that? Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting ob observation. There's that, gly that glycine repeat there, the GG, that leads to that, uh, that kink or hinge. And uh, there have been suggestions that that might convey like a termination, a signal for terminating the, the processive cleavage of the helix, but I don't think that there has been any work that has critically evaluated that idea. Um, I mean, there are proposals that uh, mutations that occur in that uh, N-terminal juxtamembrane region that might 
affect the ability of the transmembrane helix to sort of descend into membrane. Mm -hmm. uh, like that terminal lysine, which if, that, if you mutate that, then you can pull the helix down and you get shorter A beta. But whether, you know, what are just sort of for the wild type protein, what aspects of the sequence are signaling the initiation and the termination, I think is still very open. And that glycine repeat, I know Chuck Sanders in that early work in 2008, Jim Prestigard uh, had proposed based on that observation that that might be playing a role there. We don't, we see that as more of a hinge in bilayer uh, than a kink. And then of course you have to think, what does that look like in the active site of gamma secretase? And maybe Laura so the, um, answer. Does the hinge that. angle, does it depend on the bilayer thickness? Does it change? It does, yeah, it does substantially. And also if you're in a micelle environment, you can see a much more uh, significant kink. Uh, what we see in a thicker bilayer is that if you're analyzing the fluctuations, you see that as a hinge, but as the bilayer thickens, then you see, you know, you see that uh, is uh, straightened. So, but it's certainly a point of flexibility and it, and it could even in the active site, uh, you know, be, be part of the signaling for the termination of the, of the cleavage, so. Great, thank you. Thanks. So Joan, can we continue discussion? You, you, I know you got to leave. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you John, your... I, have, I have to leave. Sure, you, but you we, can, we can carry on. on. Beauties. But thank you so much for the talks and um, Rams is gonna take over as chair and uh, the, con the discussion will go on. So sure. thank you and thank bye. Thank you very much, Great to see you, John. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Thank you. So I have another question. So if the peptide is cleaved in the greasy layer of the membrane, which is the case for APP and A beta production, and we know that lipids surrounding the peptide is going to accelerate the aggregation of A beta peptide from oligomers and other species. So what factors drive the A beta peptide upon cleavage um, to be soluble? And uh, to enable the solubility of the peptide as well as um, you know, further aggregation in the solution phase. Right, I think, well, you you probably have a better answer to the No, no, we, we the, only look the at the A-beta peptide in the membrane, but right. the fact that in nature, the peptide is produced, then we see the peptide species in the solution as well, in the, in the biological fluid and so on. So I wonder, there must be factors driving the peptide out of the membrane, maybe pos possibly a peptide binding to metals. Oh forming soluble species would drive the complex into the solution phase? I, I think that's no. possible. I think also pH uh, could have an effect the charge state. You can have significant variation in the charge state depending on, depending on the pH. Uh, so, right, it, it's been observed that you would, and we imagine that once a, when a, a beta is initially formed that it might associate with the the surface, but it, it could be it could be pH, thermal fluctuations. I mean, just concentration. Um, we are looking at the equilibrium of the surface associated state as opposed to dissociated state. You're going to have a driving force there, but I think that, that's a that's a very good question. Thank you very much. And oh. there are many on that point. There are many FAD sure. mutants. Yeah, yeah. Which you could think of it in terms of solubility. Mm -hmm. sure. Magda, you have some questions? Because yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I really enjoyed both talks. Thank you very much, uh, Yoji and John. I'll start first with my question for John. Have you looked into omega three uh, fatty acids? Uh, and because it has been shown um, that they affect uh, a better uh, aggregation and. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? Uh, how they change the membrane? Do they bind? Uh, I think that's a very interesting question. We have, not, uh, we have not looked at that. In fact, we've looked at a relatively um, few number of lipids or uh, the, the variety of lipids we could certainly enhance. I didn't mention today, but we've looked at uh, sphingomyelin, which of course associates with cholesterol and can affect these, uh, the formation and stabilization of RAF domains, but with, would compete with cholesterol interacting with C99. 
I think it, looking at the uh, omega-3 fatty acids would be, would be interesting as well. Um, and then uh, these glycosylated lipids have also been proposed to play an important role. And I think it's, um, these are all very interesting questions in thinking about the membrane heterogeneity. And it could be important in these arguments related to partitioning. I mean, certainly membrane within the cell is, is more complex uh, and there are more lipids participating. And so I think we should should look at that and it'd be great to have some experiments that might, might look at that in a way that could validate calculations or maybe drive the questions. Good, yeah. Okay. I know that there, there are a lot of suggestions for the role in diet and things like this, but I think just looking at the, looking at the intermolecular interactions would be great. Yeah, I I need to see the, I, I need to dig out the reference because I, it's, Somewhere I have it in my mind that it does affect the amyloid formation of a beta, oh. but uh, when you find that, if you find that, and I'll look myself that you can yeah, send yeah. it my way. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and my question for you, G, is um, in regard to the familial mutants, uh, I know it's it's a little bit jumping ahead because you, you studied all the wild type proteins. But uh, what is your comment, and especially for TDP43, which is on the larger side, uh, and how, how, how can, you, can you comment on the familial mutants of TDP43, how it will change the whole, um, can you predict how they will affect the whole phase diagram uh, for, let's say, TDP43, which is a little bit larger and like, uh, a better, which is so on the, a smaller side. That's a, a difficult uh, question to me. The, so the, the other mutant uh, concerns, uh, it is possible that the S protein it comes to the A protein, which means the uh, amyloidogenicity increase. But the uh, TDP43 is uh, located here. That's uh, basically the a, a amorphous aggregates with amyloid cores or something like that. So the a, a, so uh, they form amyloids uh, quickly according to uh, this uh, uh, phase diagram. But the product might be changed. Uh, so the TDP43, uh, uh, so the mostly the, 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 if you use uh, entire protein, I think uh, they form the, the largely the, the amorphous aggregates. But uh, if you uh, take out the, the fragments, uh, they form the, 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 the typical the, the um, amyloid fibers. So the, in that sense, the mutation might change the uh, uh, content uh, regions of the uh, amyloidogenic uh, uh, structures, amyloid structures. But uh, I have no exact answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. And I, I have a follow-up uh, question. You, you kind of touched base at the beginning of your talk about the reversibility. So let, let's, like it's mostly what is the reversibility of the stage four, for example, if you remove that uh, high temperature slash concentration, uh, which of, of the, uh, like we know about amyloids, well, in some cases they can be reversible, um, but, can you comment on that, like on an amorphous? That uh, depends on uh, conditions. And uh, uh, basically, even if uh, amyloids uh, so the, the rigid heart aggregates, uh, uh, it is just a conformational change. So the, if you uh, reduce the uh, uh, concentration, uh, it can be back to the the monomeric states. And uh, 
So that's my impression. And uh, you need to decrease the protein concentration to uh, dissolve the preformed uh, amyloid fibers. And uh, amyloids uh, can be dissolved at a pretty high temperature. And for some proteins, lower temperature uh, might work. And uh, so the, also the, it takes a time because uh, uh, dissolution uh, takes a time. And uh, we previously checked the effect of the, the agitation and in particular the ultrasonication the, to accelerate that kind of the dissolution process. And uh, it seems it work, uh, it works. So the, because of the amyloids uh, deposit uh, kind of the uh, rigid uh, 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 substance in terms of the uh, uh, physics. So you need a kind of the agitation and the ultrasonication is also useful to accelerate the uh, dissolution. And the temperature is also the sometimes uh, quite effective for or accelerating the dissolution. Uh, is that all right? So did that my e, e comment? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, Yuji-san, Gatu-san, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned about the critical micellar concentration and um, we know that for certain amyloids, uh, aggregation rate, um, is different below and above CMC, but some of the amyloid proteins it doesn't make, make a big difference, um, the micelle formation. Can you comment on that? So the, you say the amyloid critical concentration, right, yeah. to my definition, below the critical concentration, they don't form the amyloid fibers. So the mm -hmm. two make the amyloid fibers like a, a, a SDS micelle, the total concentration should be above the CMC. And uh, CMC, in this case, is a kind of the solubility. And the excess amount of the uh, monomers mm. uh, convert to the e amyloid fibers. And uh, oppositely, conversely, if you decrease the total concentration below the CMC, the amyloids tend to dissolve to the monomers, but because of the uh, persistence, rigidity of the amyloid fibers, I suggested kind of the agitation is uh, necessary. Uh, so the amyloid formation is basically the thermodynamic uh, phase transition uh, determined by the solubility. And the solubility of the amyloids might be different from the solubility of the amorphous aggregates. That uh, make the story a little bit complicated. Uh, and the Thank super you. saturation barrier uh, is also the, a little bit complicated. So the, but the solubility is a quite important issue, I think. Yeah, yeah. People, people don't. That, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Vikash, do you have any questions? I think Matthew will go first, then I'll go. Yeah, Dr. Mathis, you can go ahead with your question. Uh, uh, good morning from Cleveland. We have two minutes left. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yeah, yeah great. Yes, uh, good to see you, Yuji. Uh, oh, Matthias, how are you? So this is a bigger picture question and things I don't know enough about, uh, which is, well, there seems to be an inverse relationship between the prevalence of humans to get cancers or Alzheimer's-like diseases. Yet, uh, I think John's work and others shows nicely that lower pH and high cholesterol correlate with both. So any thoughts? I guess we are looking at very molecular level stuff and this is more systems-based uh, issues. But So okay. is that go ahead, go ahead, Yuchi. So the, could you repeat the question? I, I, oh, the I, question I, was whether uh, you think these mechanisms with lower pH and high cholesterol 
also might uh, play a role in, in cancers. And then why the, there's some observed inverse uh, relationships. So people who get cancers don't tend to have uh, Alzheimer's disease and vice versa. So the, I don't know exactly, but uh, mm -hmm. according to our hypothesis that uh, solubility is important. So interacting with uh, other components, uh, cholesterol, uh, for example, uh, might uh, change the solubility of the uh, ABP. So the association uh, may decrease the uh, solubility of a beta and uh, that may uh, bring uh, lots of impact so the uh, uh, so the that's a uh, uh, quite a uh, classical uh, protein science uh, idea uh, upon interacting with other uh, uh, component uh, so solubility may increase or decrease and uh, we are thinking some uh, kind of the, uh, 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 so the, the substances which accelerate the, or which promote the amyloid formation may uh, decrease the uh, uh, sorbity upon complex formation. On the other hand, some uh, uh, compounds tend to suppress the amyloid formation. Uh, that maybe might be explained in terms of the increased uh, solubility of the complex okay. binding. But uh, so the, I don't know the, if I could uh, answer uh, your question. It's an intriguing question. I, I'm not sure either. I mean, impact on immune system certainly doesn't readily explain that. So. Is that, and uh, where has that been demonstrated, the inverse correlation between cancer and AD? I, I found a couple of papers, but I, I can- Interesting. Send you That's interesting. Maybe it's not as widely recognized or accepted. It's, you always find papers on something, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess they've done, they've corrected for age. That is that if you get cancer earlier, you don't live longer to uh, contract Alzheimer's disease or something. Well, I'll have to look. I'll have to look at that. And thanks for your thanks for all of the good comments and questions on the uh, coarse grain simulation. I'll certainly be looking into that. Thanks very much. Yeah, the devil is in the details. This <laughs> this is question now is morphed into one, what is the right experimental value, I think, for glycophorin A. Yeah, <laughs> right. We always seemed like a brick. I mean, it's so, it's the model system for the very stable um, telix diamond membranes, but- That's right. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Rikash, do you have any question? There's another yeah, person I, in the panel. I have, so like one okay, go ahead. for each speaker. I'll start with Professor Straub. It's a very nice talk, actually. It gave a new direction to think about. So I think partially you talked about the sphingomyelin in the involvement of lipid order and disorder that Magda talked about. So I was wondering, like, uh, if you look at the literature, we know that the gamma secretase actually has three different cleavage sites, which people generally term as gamma, then jeta, and epsilon, right? Like one is at 40 to 42, and one is 46, and one is 49. Right. So if looking at your data, it gave me an impression is that like when this C99 is complex with cholesterol or presumably now you are testing also sphingolipid and cholesterol that you mentioned. So I was thinking that does that packing of C19 with cholesterol or sphingolipid actually uh, make this kind of cleavage site to decide for the gamma secretes? Um, so so which... which uh... You're thinking C99 with cholesterol? Yeah, like yeah. do you think like the cholesterol binding actually somehow shift the gamma secretase cleavage site to produce the A-beta fragments? Yeah, I mean there I think there has been some speculation that if you if you did have stronger binding, 
uh, that you, uh, with the cholesterol, that that would increase the barrier for drawing the transmembrane helix further down relative to the catalytic aspartates. And so that you would, you would be preventing the formation of some of the shorter isoforms of, of A-beta. Um, is that what you're referring to? Or that, you know, it could, I guess it could also, uh, you know, potentially direct it to the initiation site. I haven't really looked, really considered, I'm not sure if anyone has tried to model C99 with cholesterol yeah. associated in the active site of gamma secretase that that could certainly be yeah that would be very yeah. interesting yeah because it would be very interesting yeah. or other lipids if there was some specific lipid binding that was playing a role in the right yeah, in the because, direction i think that's in a very good question i'm not yeah i think like one direction people are proposing is that like you have different mutation in gamma secretase and that could actually affect the different cleavage side but looking at your data it gave me an impression it could be because of the molecular packing of your lipids in the certain active site that can alter your cleavage site of gamma secretase. Right. And sphingomyelin, yeah. sphingomyelin is actually directly connected to the aging diseases, for example, Alzheimer's disease, even cholesterol. So I was just trying to get your comment on that. No, yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great comment. I mean, we have looked at really Laura Dominguez's group has looked at the role of the surrounding lipid environment on tipping the active versus inactive states of gamma secretase. I mean, there certainly is an impact there, but on this more sort of specific interactions with the substrate and so on, I think it's a, it's a great question. Thank I you. I don't know, yeah. Uh, I think my next question is for Gota Sensei. It's a, it's a very nice talk, Gota Sensei. Your mm -hmm. super saturation concept is really fascinating. So uh, I was just I was just wondering like uh, how this supersaturation fits in a physiological system, because if you look at the paper published by Professor Tanaka at Riken, so they have mm -hmm. clearly demonstrated for the prion protein they are working on yeast prion sub thirty five. So when you increase the temperature and you make this kind of fibers, ultimately you shift the core of the amyloid fiber. For example, if your amyloid core is in the wild type, like in the protein, in the normal temperature, forms from the residue 40 to 70, if you increase the temperature, ultimately you actually change, you shift the amyloid core, right? So this kind of agitation and temperature, and when we are connecting that to supersaturation, I don't know how relevant physiologically that to give us one impression. Okay. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we uh, so the uh, focused on a higher temperature, high temperature, but uh, because the folding and the amyloid formation are kind of the linked function, so the even a fraction of the denatured state is quite small at the uh, physiological temperature. So the uh, amyloid formation get uh, shift the equilibrium. And uh, so the uh, even uh, physiological temperatures, once amino formation started, the native state uh, shift uh, to the uh, uh, denatured state and eventually the amyloid uh, formation happens. So the physiological uh, relevance, I think that this kind of the mechanism, uh, I, I say, linked function of the protein folding and the amyloid formation may work quite uh, 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 in, importantly. And uh, under the some uh, 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 particular conditions which destabilize the native structure, of course, uh, uh, amyloid formation uh, tend to happen more easily, the mutations and so on. But the temperature effects are quite interesting, which uh, people never uh, recognize so far. And uh, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that explains the question. And I, also, I was wondering, like in the physiological system, uh, like people have demonstrated chemical modulators that can actually break the supersaturation within minutes. So I'm not going to those chemical modulators. Even in the physiological condition, people have reported, for example, in the brain, we have polyamine. And also there is another tiny protein that form Fuji complex, for example, sub protein that has been characterized recently that actually break the supersaturation like within like few hours. You don't need temperature or any kind of, of 
like yeah, so those uh, uh, additives are of course are uh, quite important okay. uh, to break the super saturation the mechanism might be the interact interaction or uh, uh, change the solubility of the uh, uh, proteins without the additives that kind of the reaction may happen uh, did you say polyphosphate uh, i said polyamine yeah, polyphosphate, of course. Yeah, I just recently come through your polyphosphate paper that you published last month. I read that paper that is very interesting, but polyamine is also shown to actually break the supersaturation very quickly. And it is concentration independent. So you don't need a concentration dependent to break the supersaturation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think there are a variety of the compounds uh, which uh, may uh, break the supersaturation. And, uh, is uh, uh, Matthias uh, back still uh, here, there? I think he's still, uh, I think he left. Okay. Yeah. So he worked with uh, alcohol uh, previously. Yeah. yeah. And the alcohol is also the a, a, a compound, uh, solvent, a breaking super saturation. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I think. Uh, 12, 10 here. There's only one, one question left in the panel if you guys are ready to answer that. Sumay Zhang, would you like to ask your question directly to the speakers? Yes. Or in the panel now? Yes. Uh, my, Go ahead. My, quest, uh, yeah. my question is for Dr. Gotu. So yes. it's, it seems the backbound, especially in right backbound, backbound interaction of amino acid backbound, right? The peptide backbound. When backbound backbound uh, interaction, especially in register, it seems deciding the critical concentration of uh, amlock state. And how do you weight it between uh, backbound, back, backbound interaction and side chain, side chain interaction? How so do you weight differently in different states, native folding or amyloid? So the, I don't uh, follow your question. You uh, uh, ask the, Backbone, backbone interactions and the side chain, side chain interactions, something That's like right. that. Yes. So the, uh, yeah. I assume that the uh, amyloid uh, formation is dominated by the uh, uh, backbone interactions. Side chain interactions are of course uh, important, but uh, in compared com uh, compared with uh, native folding, native is definitely the optimally packed state. And the amyloid states, uh, David Eisenberg uh, insists the steric uh, GIP or the core structures, but uh, it's impossible to form the such a tightly packed state for the entire region of the protein molecule. So the in total, uh, uh, so the amyloid uh, states uh, uh, to my e, e idea, the less packed, but the uh, amyloids are uh, formed because uh, that's a uh, optimized uh, structure above the solubility. So the, it's not necessary e, to uh, make a tight packing. That's a phase transition from the soluble state to the e, solid state, uh, solid-like state. So the e, uh, some part of the molecule may uh, be tightly packed, but uh, it's impossible to expect uh, such a tight packing for the entire molecules. And uh, I, I, I forgot what's the answer, uh, uh, question D. Uh, question is uh, uh, side chain packing and uh, no, uh, uh, some, uh, yes. About, yeah, about the backbound, uh, they actually, Important for the elongation of uh, for the elongation of the uh, amyloid state, but that I think is related with deciding the critical what exactly the critical concentration for this sequence of peptides. Yeah, so the critical concentration is a, a kind of the a monomer accessible monomer concentration above the critical concentration. You can. Uh, Remember the critical micelle concentration. 
I think the situation is very similar. So above the critical myself concentration, interactions get uh, uh, so the uh, uh, larger, so that uh, they tend to form the amyloid fibers. And uh, the, uh, because uh, a variety of the proteins can form amyloid fibers uh, by the similar mechanism, uh, I think uh, amyloid uh, structures, uh, main chain dominated structure, that kind of the uh, uh, concept uh, people discussed uh, previously. And the uh, native structure is a side chain dominated structure. And both are important, but uh, uh, relatively, so amyloid structures are uh, uh, main chain dominated structure. I like that kind of the idea. Uh, although the microcrystals, tend to form uh, show the tight packing. But uh, uh, I just uh, remember the phase separation, liquid, liquid phase separation. They, uh, those peptides can form the amyloid-like uh, structures in which uh, uh, packing is uh, much less than that of the uh, uh, typical the, the amyloid uh, structures. So the amyloids, uh, uh, that, that's a kind of the, the conditions, but uh, uh, amyloid structures are not necessarily the tightly packed. Uh, a variety of the packing is possible. And uh, a kind of the criterion is an uh, ordered structure uh, that a protein can form above this solubility uh, so that the uh, 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 polymorphs are very, very possible to happen. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Gotesan. Thank you very much, uh, Sumai. Uh, thanks, John, as well. Um, great talks, great uh, Q and A session, and uh, we would like to post your lectures in the, the YouTube channel. Is this okay with you both? Yes, uh, uh, I'm very pleased. Uh, yeah, me too. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much. For, yeah. Thanks for hosting and organizing this. It was really this great. Great. Very nice to see you, Yuji, also. Lams. Thank you all. And then we'll meet in the Zeminar series on April 10th. Yeah, so we have two weeks break. Lams. Enjoy the, Lams. Over there. Yeah. Thanks, Rams. Magda and Vikash. I want to say something to you. Yeah. I want to come to Michigan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> come anytime. Anytime. We, we need to have the vaccination, right? <laughs> I can travel to uh, Michigan sooner or later. Yeah. <laughs> Virus, I mean, uh, we are very close to the Detroit airport. So Detroit is a major hub for, uh, you know, international airlines like Delta, for example. You can straight away take flight from Osaka to here. Uh, I think that's a direct flight. Yeah. So, so I'll be very happy to host you here. Definitely. We'll meet. Sayonara. Go to, start. Go to bed now. Bye. <laughs> Thank you all very much. And we'll yeah. see you on April 10th. Thanks, John.